Thank you. How do you ad lib with a bagpipe? I don't know, but it sounded great. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, 17th, maybe the 18th annual Culver Hill ceremony. I'm Gary Vancor, the town historian, and I'll be the MC and your chief speaker later on. We uh, welcome all of you, and one thing that we want to do is make sure that everybody, and I can see you're well spaced out, you know, it's amazing what a year will do. A year ago, I never knew what social distancing meant. Wearing a mask was something that we did when we played cowboys and Indians and bank robbers and that sort of thing. And now, here we are with a station. If you don't have a mask, you're more than welcome to take one. We have hand cleaning sanitizers over there, so please feel free. I'd like to uh, kick off our ceremony with the raising of the Star Spangled Banner. We'd now like to have the Boy Scouts of Troop 46 in Beekman Town say the Pledge of Allegiance. Please remove any hats for the pledge. Scout salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Thank you very much. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce to you the town supervisor for Beacon Town, Sam Dyer. Thank, thank you, Gary, and, and thank everybody that's here today. You know, um, we talked about this. We've, we've had to postpone a lot of our activities because of, of the, the, the COVID. But, you know, I uh, thank Gary when I got here this morning and told him he's going to have to eat a little crow because we were expecting just a handful of people, and it shows, you know, when these things are done and done right, um, we've got a, a great historian in this town that does a lot of work behind the scenes that a lot of you... A lo some of you know, but but a lot of you don't. And and Gary, you know, I'm I'm very proud of what you do for Beatman Town and and all of the area. So on, on that note, um, it's enough from me. I tell everybody this is this is one of the the best jobs I have is is when I've got to follow Gary and, and give a welcome because we're showing the good things that we've done as a community, as a town, and and this park is is uh, it, it shows that hands down. You know, from the state to the Lions Club to the different organizations to the town that have worked diligently to to not just get this but keep it up. You know, um, we've all we all know over time it, it takes a lot of work to get through these things. But um, and then on another note, um, we've got some some other dignitaries that I'd I'd like to introduce and again thank everybody. But um, with with what's going on, um, I would like to say with with our state government um whether whether we agree or disagree with what goes on our representatives are, are hand downs hands down 
and, and our assembly person, Billy Jones, has done a super job from day one. And I think it speaks that he has no competition this year because of that. But at this time, I'd like to introduce our assemblyman, Billy Jones. Thank you, Sam, for that introduction. And um, I just want to I just want to say uh, a thank you um, to you and what the town has done here. And uh, although it, this may look a little different this year, um, these celebrations um, for the War of 1812 around our region, everything is different this year, let's face it. But the message still remains the same. And we're here to honor uh, the brave soldiers and veterans that came before us and that helped us in the War of 1812, and um, to all the organizations that helped out with preserving this hollow ground. And um, you, Sam had mentioned Gary, um, unbelievable work that Gary does here um, for the town and keeping the history alive. I think uh, around a lot of these communities in the North Country, we have a very rich history, and certainly here in Beekman Town, and uh, it takes a lot of work to keep this alive. And although the skirmish here, the engagement here was brief, the significance behind it remains great. And that's due in large part to a lot of you and to Gary and his organizations and everybody that had a part in this. It was mentioned the state had a part of it, but we all know the state doesn't do anything unless they're prodded to do something. And uh, certainly the town and the county, Mark Henry is here, the chair of the Clinton County Legislature, and um, the Historical Society, along with the work that Gary did, and I understand the Lions Club had a lot to do with it, and all the organizations that came together to make this, uh, this what it is today. And it's just a beautiful spot that we can remember and that we can honor our veterans. And the significance of this in minimizing the British leading into Plattsburgh should never be forgotten. And so we are kicking off some ceremonies around the region, but certainly the significance here in Beekman Town and honoring our British and American soldiers remains strong. So thank you very much, and it's an honor to be here today. I just want you to know that my salary for the year just disappeared. I had to pay off Sam, but now I have to pay off the assemblyman for kind thoughts as well. I I don't know, and I can't. I understand there's no raises this year, Sam. Mark Henry, I don't have an official job for. Uh, he said as long as his name was mentioned three times, it was okay. So Billy did once. I did it again. Did you say his name, or did you just no, no, no? So that means I got one more time to go. Before we start with a few words about what happened here over 200 years ago, uh, you should have received a program. And if you didn't, I have some extras. But programs sometimes, you know, you get them, you kind of glance at them, and that's it. But I would like you to just take a look at it if you have one, because on the cover we have a picture, or it's really a a drawing that was done for a book that was published in 1869. Uh, a fellow by the name of Lossing came back and wanted to follow the pathway of the British. This is this image on the cover is what the British would have seen approximately coming up Culver Hill. And unfortunately, with a reproduction, it's probably more dark than. But you can see the hill going up. It didn't have a cut in it like it did does today. That was because of road construction that did a lot of uh, excavating. On the inside cover of the program is a very brief synopsis of what happened in Beekman Town, including about, oh, maybe less than a mile, mile or so, just north here, we call it the first encounter. That was the first blood drawn during the invasion on September 6, 1814. And then the next stand was right here. And this is where uh, Major John Wool and his regular army of 250 and the remnants of the militia, most of which when they encountered the British and saw what happened, decided it was wiser to go home and protect the home front than 
than get in the way of that. And so we had about 30 or so militia that were here. Uh, not all militia were local farmers that came out once in a while. There were state militia as well, and, and they tended to be better trained. But this is a very brief, in case you need a synopsis of it. I also want you to take a look at the back of the program, because none of these ceremonies are done by any one person or even two or three people. There's a cadre of people here. We, we wouldn't have this if it wasn't for the reenactors. We wouldn't have it if it wasn't for the, the flag honor guard. We wouldn't have it if it wasn't for the, the bugler. We wouldn't have it if it wasn't for the volunteers that come and help set up and tear down and, and all the things that go into it. And this is just a brief list of some of those people and groups that add to this. And some they do it for nothing. They do it for, good, for the good of the community. And for that, we appreciate and thank everybody who's here as a volunteer. And that's, well, Billy, you get paid. Sam gets paid. I used to get paid before I had to pay him off. But we're volunteers. We're volunteers. And we appreciate and thank you. We'd also like to recognize some of the descendants of the people that were in the community at the time or with the British Army. And we have two of those folks that are here representing the Dominey family who will be laying the wreaths, and I'll, I'll get to that shortly. I'd like to just do a quick remembrance of what happened on September 6th. And I would also like to take a different focus. I tend to be a people person. I tend not to remember the regiment names and all the different types of uniforms and that sort of stuff. I, I like to look at them, but I, you know, my brain has got so much information in there, it has no more room for that. But I do like the story of the people. And I knew we were going to have some youngsters here. We have the Scouts and Cub Scouts. I have grandchildren in, in the audience. And I, I think about that because part of what we know about went on here was because of seven-year-olds. They were seven years old when they lived in their house up on Route 22. Uh, this is the Dominey House. It became later known as the Dawson House. It's still a house where it's a home to people, the Gagno family have it. And the British formed their ranks and they marched down Route 22. And, and because of Henry Dominey, who was seven years old at the time, and later on was interviewed when he was an, an older man, we knew what was going on. And the other one was right across the street. Before the stone house was built, it was, it was more just uh, lay than pat, uh, plaster. Uh, it was the Culver family, thus the name Culver Hill. And young Nathaniel Culver, Culver was seven years old. And he was there in the cellar while the battle took place right outside the door. And he luckily lived long enough, so when he was interviewed at the end of the 1800s, was able to tell what happened here. Having children involved in warfare was nothing new. Uh, kids would be enlisted. I, I, in some countries today, they're still the, the children soldiers. But it was commonplace. And some of the things that they were used for were on the ships. And I'm sure that if we had a, a good listing of the documentation that they would have what we call powder monkeys. Powder monkeys were the kids that were small and could go into the, the hold of the ship and bring out the gunpowder. They were one of the first ones targeted in a battle because without the powder, the cannons don't work. And yet they often were poor kids in the streets of London that would be taken and put in the, in the Navy. Uh, others, they did it to get away from their home life. Drummer boys. And again, drummers were the ones that would do the signaling between the drummers and the buglers. And that's why the different drum beats that they have would tell the troops. Because once fighting started with the, with the, guns, uh, the, with the smoke of the powder 
and, and the confusion of battle, you didn't know what was going on. So if you could hear that drum, you knew what you were supposed to do. And they were often kids. Now, if you killed a kid with a drum, then the army gets confused. And not only that, but younger folks than you may think of, I look at these Boy Scouts and I think they were some of the regular army. The ones that we have engraved on this stone list some of them. Now, we in this area remember the story of Aiken's volunteers. They were kids that went to the Plattsburg Academy. They rushed out. They were good shots. Quite often they were hunters. They rushed out and they wanted to fight the invading British. And they were here, there, and everywhere. And they were very good at what they did. They received congressional recognition later on. They were too young to be a, get the regular recognition. But the British, they had people enlist when they were 12 and 14 years old. Now I want you scouts to think about this. 12 and 14 years old, you're in the regular British Army. A lot of them, as they marched down the road, were actually from Ireland. And they came from Ireland in, in part because they were in seek of a, a better of life. The Irish were, they had an impoverished history. And if they joined the army, they were able to make some kind of advancement. And the first British name over here on the stone is Lieutenant Colonel James Willington. They were the East Kent Regiment, the third bus. I remember they were the bus. But I had to say that for my reenactor friends. And the... He was the youngest male of a large family in County Tipperary in Ireland. Now, the land always went to the oldest one, so therefore he didn't have much of a future. So his parents bought him a commission. That's right, bought him a commission in the British Army. If you had the money, you could buy an officership. Don't know if that's a real word. I just made it up, but you know what I meant. Now, he also had a relative, I believe it was a nephew, who was coming down at the same time, but over on Route 9, Lieutenant Charles Welch. So we had two from the same family here in Plattsburgh. James Willington, and the reason I know this is because of Roy and Joe Carter, who, by the way, send their greetings, wanted to be here. They're from Marlborough, England, and travel restrictions is if they could get in, they would never be able to get back home. With It's a travel, the UK and the United States are restricted. And so they held on to the, the longest they could and then had to cancel their plans. So according to Roy and Joe, who were the descendants of Colonel Wellington, James enlisted at the age of 16 and he was, would have been an officer of the lower level. He fought in the Napoleonic Wars, in particular the Iberian Campaign, which is France and Portugal. They were fierce, fierce fights, where a large percentage of the entire unit was killed. He survived that. Once Napoleon was defeated the first time and was sent to Elba, the British decided that, okay, we're kind of suspicious that Napoleon isn't done. It's not the last we've seen of him. We better keep these soldiers around. Let's send them over to Canada and clean up this little mess over here, which was really second concern. I mean, the, the French and the English, that was the big concern. So Wellington, who had survived those initial battles with the British and where major parts of his unit were wiped out, was the lead officer coming down Route 22 or the Beekman Town Road. He was 36, therefore he had been 20 years in the service. He had been promoted in the field to Lieutenant Colonel. They call it Brevet. Most a lot of they they buy their position, but this one he, he earned. And he came up the hill rallying his troops and from what Nathaniel Culver reported was bringing his troops on. He was a kind of come on boys type of guy. 
and a musket went through his throat. And that was the end of his career and the end of his life. Now, the other one over here listed for the British was Ensign John Chapman. Ensign was the lowest officer ship. They believe that he, his parents, bought him that commission at the age of 14. So at the age of 14, he was an officer in the British Army. Low, low, but still an officer. And he was with this group that came up through, and he was killed at the ripe old age of 16 years old. Both he and Willington were buried at the foot of the hill until later on. Further on down the road, there was another really bloody skirmish at Halsey's Corners. By then, the Americans had brought out some cannon. And there was one other English officer who was wounded there, brought down to one of the local houses, one of the plot houses, and he died of his wounds. And that was Lieutenant Robert Kingsbury. And he was an old, old guy. He was 18 years old. And so we have those three British officers killed on the way into Plattsburgh, all in this route. And two were right here at this site. An old timer at the 36 and a kid who probably was his first military, his first battle, and he didn't make it. Now the Americans had both regular under Major John Wool, and I believe it was the 26th Regiment. How'd I do, guys? Did I get it right? And also the militia. And one of those militia was from Essex, in the Essex militia. And that person was from what we would now call Wilmington. They called it Jay, but it was really Wilmington. And according to Nathaniel Culver, and I'm sure he was told this, but he remembered it, that he was, this fellow was nearsighted, Stephen Partridge, or Patridge. He was a corporal, and he stood up for whatever reasons, maybe he didn't have glasses, I don't know, but he was nearsighted, and he was riddled through and through, according to Nathaniel Culver. So we had on this spot three officers, two British, one American, killed in this skirmish. Those are pretty big losses when you consider that the British had three officers killed in the entire engagement in the land, I'm not talking about the, the, the water. So two-thirds of them were killed right here. Now, in 1919, I want to step back first here. We used to say it was Stephen Pat or Partridge. About three years ago, and this is what you never know is going to happen. About three years ago, a fellow named Paul Patridge came, and they were looking for the site where their ancestor was killed. On the monument, it says Patridge. He said Patridge, but if you go to the tombstone of Stephen Patridge Partridge, in Wilmington, it says Partridge. We don't know. You know, I don't know. I guess it doesn't really make any difference. But whether it's Patridge or Partridge, he is buried in Wilmington. His brothers came and got his body after the battle and brought him home and buried him. And I know that some of the folks that are standing over there did a ceremony a year ago or so uh, at the grave site of Stephen Partridge. And on that tombstone, it says that Stephen Patridge, was corporal, was Captain Allen Peck's company of Major Reuben uh, Sanford's battalion. He was killed at the Battle of Plattsburgh, September 6, 1814. So that's all considered, this is considered part of the Battle of Plattsburgh, which I guess it was, the invasion of this, the community. Now I'd like to say a word about John Wool. John Wool is a fella who was a, he owned a bookstore. He tried different things, and when the War of 1812 started, he went into the service. And he was really good at it. And by the time that he was here, he was a major. Uh, Wool was another one of those 
we're, we're going to do what we can to hassle the British. They knew they couldn't stop this. Well, this leg alone was probably four, or 5,000 troops or more going down Route 9. They're, I mean, their they're totals are anywhere from 10 to 14,000, depending on which ones you want to use. But when they came across the border, they were probably 14,000, but they had to, to leave people behind to protect the rear guard. So they were coming down. So they're the least... 4,000 here, anyway, which is a pretty good number, considering they had 250 to stop them. And these were the best troops. These are the ones that came from the Napoleonic Wars. These were not just the third or fourth string. They were the best they had to offer. So they come down the road, and Wool stays here, and he, and he realizes that, okay, we've inflicted some damage. All we want to do is really slow them down. A little bit of a controversy about those cannon. They were supposed to be here, but Captain Leonard didn't want to do that until he got direct orders from Akum. By the time they got through here, he got the orders directly from Akum, so they met at Halsey's Corners. But Wool just wanted to kind of slow them down, make them think about it. It wasn't going to be an easy path. So between here and Halsey's Corners, the British did realize that, yeah, there's some resistance here. Now, Wool, because of what he did during the war here, was promoted uh, in the field. And later on, he went on to become a general. He went to the Mexican War and was very instrumental in that war. And when the Civil War rolled around, about 1860, 1861, he re-upped again as a general, and by the end of the war, he was a brigadier general. He was the oldest living general in the Civil War, and when he passed away, there was a very extensive obituary in the New York Times. So, this wasn't the last we saw of Wool in Plattsburgh, however. It wasn't in 1814. And this is part of the reason why the Carters really were impressed with what we were doing with our commemoration. Because even though they were enemies, and one of the signs over this is they met as enemies, but even though they met as enemies, they were treated with respect, and it went both ways. And how can you be shooting and killing each other and still have respect? But they did. And so Willington and Chapman were buried down here, but in 19, or 1819 they were reinterred in Riverside Cemetery with full military honors. In 1843, General John Wool returned to Riverside because at that point they were doing memorials to Willington and the other British officers. And, and well, of course, Crab Islands, where the enlisted men were. During the dedication of that, Wool said, it is a pleasing spectacle to see the living brave do honor to the memory of the illustrious dead. So here this was, the American army, a brigadier general who fought here, was responsible for the death of Wilmington, Willington excuse me, and Chapman, standing in Riverside Cemetery paying respect with these memorials. And this is the kind of tradition that happened immediately following and during the war. And it's a tradition that has carried through. And as a result, the United Kingdom, England, has been our, one of our longest allies in our history. And closest allies. And Canada, of course, part of the British Empire and part of the Can Canadian troops that came down at the same time, another of our longest standing allies that we've had as a nation. So we, they met as enemies, but they left as long-lasting friends. At the end of the day, approximately 45 Americans were killed. Three of them in, in Beekman Town. One, two were up with a skirmish up at the first encounter, one here. The British had over 100 killed or wounded, three officers, and two at Culver Hill. 
So once the British got in Plattsburgh, they waited for the naval fleet to come from Canada. They did a little skirmish here and there, they tried to take the bridge, Aiken's volunteers were involved with that. But it was a wait until the Navy comes. And that's why it was the bloodiest day for the British, because this was the most action along here and some also on Route 9 going into the village. So with that, I'd like to just uh, remind people that there are other ceremonies as part of the virtual and, I guess, reduced commemoration. Riverside Cemetery, and if you have a chance to go there, you can stand and look at the, the monuments for Willington and Chapman along with the other officers on both sides that were buried side by side. And if you have the opportunity, uh, Crab Island, they always do a, a wonderful ceremony out there where the enlisted men were, and we, we, we're in the hundreds now. But again, they were buried side by side. We didn't have the British section, the Americans, they were literally put right beside each other. You never heard of that. It just didn't happen in battles of enemy combatants. And so take advantage of that, and also there's going to be a ceremony down at uh, McDonough Hall. Not McDonough Hall, McDonough Monument. You could tell I'm a Plattsburgh State grad, right? McDonough followed with Hall. Used to be the Student Union, believe it or not. Spent many an hour there listening to the Chapin brothers, believe it or not. Did I just age myself? You know where McDonough Hall is? You know what the Chapin brothers are? Okay. But that's um, going to be at McDonough Monument tomorrow as well. And hopefully, i got to throw a pitch out here because one of my committee colleagues said, you need to say something about the Beekman Town Bicentennial. This is the 200th anniversary of, of the town of Beekman Town. We were part of the town of Plattsburgh, and in 1820, became a separate town. And we were in the process of doing a whole series of talks and events and things like this. This was going to be part of that bigger picture. And hopefully we come to some kind of closure with this COVID-19 thing and we are safe to go out in larger numbers. I know Billy was at the first ceremony and Mark was also Mark Henry, in case you missed his name, that's Mark Henry, there's four times, uh, and Sam. And we, we literally packed the house uh, with our initial, our kickoff. And so hopefully next year we'll be able to pick up again and have wonderful uh, discussions about other things besides the Battle of Plattsburgh, uh, things like Fantasy Kingdom and the Junior Plattsburgh and stuff like that. But, and that, that's a teaser. Now, you, you don't know what that is. You have to come next year, hopefully, and, and listen to those talks. So we are now at the part of the ceremony where we recognize and we pay tribute to the folks that died here at Culver Hill, both Americans and British, this was the 1894 is when this monument was dedicated. Uh, Dr. David Kellogg interviewed Henry Dominey, interviewed Nathaniel Culver. It was in the 1880s that he did that. In 1894, this was, was put here. And so we are going to now lay the wreaths. Uh, Esther Dominey will be doing the British. That's the official British buffs. War Memorial, that's what Joe Carter brought to us, and Scott Dominey, all part of the Dominey family, and we'll ask you to go, and you've seen this enough times, that I don't have to instruct you, remember, when you put it down, put it down sideways, because these cameras are going to take shots you do not want broadcast, right, put it down sideways, and then after you, you stand beside it, and that's your photo off, so if you would kindly do that, go ahead. Lean it right up against that monument. Now you stand and you look at all these cameras and you smile. Of course, you can't see because you have your mask on, which is very, very good. And what we're going to do is now we are going to have a slight difference from what your program says. We're going to fire the salute. So to my militiamen and my army, we're going to fire the salute. And that's going to be followed by the firing of the cannon. And then we're going to have the taps played. 